I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. David Wood, a well-known futurist, author, singularitarian, and chair of the London Futurists. Dr. Wood has an MA in math and a PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge, and over 30 years of experience in the technology industry, ranging from mobile software and OS development to corporate advisory and leadership. As a futurist, Dr. Wood has served as the co-founder of Transhumanist UK, Executive Director of Transpolitica, Node Co-Chair of the Millennium Project, Fellow with the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, and his current role as Principal at Delta Wisdom. He's also held board positions at SingularityNet, Sustensis, the LEV Foundation, and Humanity Plus. David is the author of 11 books and one of T3's 100 Most Influential People in Technology. His focus is on the radical transformation of society and humanity enabled by technological disruption. So David, welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now, as a futurist, you're following computing and AI, life extension and longevity research, and a wide variety of other social, scientific, and technological megatrends. So let me start by asking, what are you the most excited about right now? And which of these areas are well positioned for future growth? Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm excited by a lot that's going on. And I can see interconnections between breakthroughs in one field and very consequential breakthroughs in other fields as a result. The thing that's changing the most rapidly and may catch most people out is artificial intelligence. That's a field with a long history. It improved gradually from around the 1950s onwards. And then in about 2012, it went through a major revolution with neural networks and deep learning. And what's even more interesting is a new revolution, a new explosion in AI capability, which is just in the last couple of years with things like transformers, diffusion models, and so on. And that's only starting. And I expect the next few years in AI will lead to lots more capability. And in turn, that capability is going to allow people to make progress that they have, in long, that they have long anticipated in other fields such as nanotech and biotech, green technology, and cognitive, cognitive technologies, which will help us to think more clearly. So all of these things have been pending for a long time, but with AI accelerating in the way that I think it will, I think in the next 10 years, there's going to be major steps forwards in all of these fields. Mm. Now, do you think that we're missing an understanding of qualia that, that will let us truly replicate a mind in silicon? Or do you think that that's something that would just emerge over time with better neural simulations and processing power? So I confess not to fully understanding qualia. I know that I feel things. I'm not sure what it is that is in these feelings. I realize many people struggle with that question. It's one of the big mysteries to my mind the so-called hard problem of consciousness, and I don't think it can easily be waved away. But I'm not convinced we need to understand qualia in order to make real, fast, significant progress with artificial intelligence. I tend to think that powerful intelligence can exist without qualia. And therefore, even without understanding qualia, it's possible that AI, within just a few years, will be able to do either tremendously more good or tremendously more harm, depending on how we manage it. Now, in due course, it may be that AI, being cleverer than us, will explain to us qualia. And I foresee two possible futures. In one of these possible futures, the AI will say, yes, qualia is this, and it is also feeling the same sort of thing. So it is conscious too. But it's also possible it might explain to us, this is what qualia is, and its own architecture is such that it doesn't have any qualia. And both these possibilities exist in my mind. Yeah. Well, and that goes to this idea of artificial superintelligence. That was why I'd asked about that. So it, that comes back to the singularity. Now, Werner Vinge had estimated the singularity happened between 2005 and 2030. Ray Kurzweil predicted the year 2045. And recent polls by Nick Postrom and Vincent Mueller 
project around a 2040 to 2050 time frame. So what are your predictions or thoughts on a time frame if this happens at all? So we have to define our terms first. Many people talk about the singularity in different ways. So when I use the term, along with Werner Vinge, I'm talking about the arrival of intelligence that is comprehensively wiser, smarter than us humans in every way, not just in a few narrow fields, but there will be an intelligence which has better common sense, better general reasoning, better flexibility than we humans. Whether or not it has inner sentience is, I say again, a separate matter which might mm. be resolved in due course. But when will AI be able to do things like not just solve the Turing test or pass the Turing test in which a, a human wouldn't be sure if connected to an AI chatbot, whether they were talking to an AI or whether they were talking to a human, the AI would be able to do such a good job of answering questions in a human-like way. So the super intelligence of the singularity would be able to do all of that, but a heck of a lot more. Now, when might that happen? In the last few years, many people have revised their forecasts of this. People who study AI carefully, who study AI safety carefully, and many more people are thinking there's a chance that we will have this by 2030. Not an overwhelming chance, but I would say there's at least 20% chance that within just eight years, we will have such an artificial general intelligence in our midst, and that will change everything. It will change things in ways that are hard to predict, because if this intelligence really is smarter than us, we won't be able to understand, at least initially, all of its motivations and what incentivizes it. So it may have different things in its mind. That's what makes it unpredictable, which is where Werner Vinge's concept of the singularity comes in. We can't see beyond it and have any confidence about what motivations will apply. Mm. Ray Kurzweil has a slightly different model. He imagines more of a slow ramp up. So he imagines that the Turing test might be passed around 2029, to give him his credit. Ray has held that date fixed for many years, even decades. But then he imagines it will take quite a lot longer for AI to reach what he calls the singularity. I think that on the contrary, once AI is smarter than us in every way, it will be able to improve itself rapidly. And so there'll be a phase change in the improvement trajectory. It will go not just exponentially, but super exponentially or hyper exponentially, at least for a while. And so within years, possibly within months or even weeks, the AI that reaches this level will have self-improved by a variety of methods to be significantly smarter than before. So I don't think there's going to be a long gap between passing the Turing test and reaching the singularity. That's why I think it's more likely to come sooner than the 2045 date that Ray suggests. But there's nothing set in stone about it. This is not an inevitable forecast by no means. Well, and actually, that was my next question, is whether you think that the singularity is, is inevitable. And it, the reason I ask that is it seems like there's this convergence of social market and technological pressures that are driving advances in computing and artificial intelligence. And so, you know, as you mentioned, even without having qualia, even without knowing whether or not it's truly feeling on a level or thinking on a level that we are, I guess, um, you know, in terms of super intelligence, being able to solve problems so much more effectively and efficiently than we are, it 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 does seem like there are so many different factors driving that into reality. So, do you think there's inevitability there, or or not? Well, first, I want to agree that there are a multitude of factors which are accelerating the likelihood of yet more improvements in AI. There's huge commercial competition here. The companies that are able to develop and then deploy smarter AI in almost any industry, they will be ahead of their previous competitors who lack that AI up-to-date skills. So whether it's investing in the stock market, whether it's creating games with AI characters, whether it's writing user interface software, whether it's doing customer support, whether it's creating new medicines and drugs, all of them stand to be commercially advanced hugely by advanced AI. So there's lots of people studying it, and not just for the commercial competitive reasons, also for geopolitical competitive reasons. The Chinese leadership 
were shocked by the fact that Western developed software from DeepMind could defeat their champion Go player, who they thought was better than the Korean player, who famously was defeated by DeepMind in 2016, but their young Go superstar was comprehensively routed by the DeepMind software early in 2017. And the Chinese leadership, unsurprisingly, said they did not want to live in a world in which all the shots were called by American software. So they resolved to accelerate their own initiative. And they have invested hugely at the national level, but also at the regional level, in all kinds of ways to improve AI. Vladimir Putin doesn't want to be left behind. The Saudi Arabians don't want to be left behind. The Europeans and the Americans in their own way don't let, want to be left behind either. So there's more and more people scrabbling for ways to improve AI quickly. And there are lots of ideas for how these improvements can take place. But I say again, this isn't inevitable. All of these improvements depend upon certain aspects of the infrastructure of society. There needs to be sufficient respect for science. There needs to be sufficient tolerance of openness. Often the ideas that break through are sort of heretical. They are deemed to be weird by the established leaders. It turns out that some of these weird ideas are the ones that do break through, like neural networks and deep learning was dismissed for many decades by the main gurus of classical AI as being irrelevant, as being just a toy. But thankfully, in the West, we had the encouragement of uh, mavericks, and that openness to mavericks, that openness to new combinations is key to progress. And there are worrying signs in this world of lack of a respect for science. There is more and more fake science. There is more and more politicized science. Sometimes if you suggest a cure for COVID or a response to COVID, the answer is not, let's look at the science, but which politician is supporting that? Oh, Donald Trump is supporting that. Therefore, I will either support it or reject it, just based on the politics rather than based on the science. And there are more examples of that. And there are more trends, sadly, of populism, of post-truth, of polarization in society, which could lead to a new dark age, especially when there are other pressures like changes in climate, when there are resource shortages in some parts of the world made worse by the battle in Ukraine, which is affecting food distribution, where there are more refugees, where there could be politicians who play to the gallery and lead to shutting down, in effect, either deliberately or unintentionally, the kinds of scientific progress that we need for this breakthroughs in AI. So I see this about a 30% chance we won't make it to the singularity, and instead we will go off on a trajectory to a new dark age. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so let me touch on, actually, I want to touch on both of those aspects. I, I want to touch on the benefits of the singularity, but let me touch on the, the dark age aspects of this first. So Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk have all voiced concerns about AI superintelligence. Uh, Stephen Hawking famously said, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. And Elon Musk believes that general AI is the greatest existential threat to humanity. So are they right to be concerned about this, given the unpredictable nature of it? Absolutely right. This is a highly explosive technology. It won't destroy the world just by itself. It will destroy the world in combination with other fault lines that are already here, such as our nuclear weapons arsenals. If AI is partially overseeing that, and if there are mistakes or misprogramming in the AI, it could trigger World War III. There could also be combinations due to AI being empowered to do things like driving up share prices by manipulating social media or driving up the liking of various politicians so that we vote for them. And this could have detrimental outcomes. So I don't want to look at this in isolation, that we've got our current day problems and then there's this weird thing over here called AGI, which might be a new problem. I think the problems are connected. But there mm. are risks of AI going wrong. It goes, can go wrong in a multitude of different ways. And so we need to be very smart looking at the different scenarios for how AI can go wrong. There are roughly four catastrophic failure modes. 
which I don't have time to go into in depth, but roughly there could be bugs in the software, despite it being brilliant. Often very brilliant software still has bugs in it, just like very brilliant human beings sometimes have bugs in them. So we think they're geniuses, and then one day they do something completely stupid. Well, software can do the same. Then there can be bugs in the design, which is that the software might do exactly what we asked it to do, but if we'd thought more carefully, we wouldn't have asked it to do that. that. There were other things that we failed to specify. Then there could be the design could itself be good, but it might be changed by circumstances. As the software gets more powerful and more sophisticated, it could interact with other software, and it could end up with actually changing its goals, changing its design. And finally, just as the design could be overridden, the implementation might be overridden. It might be hacked. We might write software that's very good and sound, but other people might take the same software, they might reverse engineer it, and they might tweak it for their own purposes. Sometimes they might just want it to go faster, and they might say, we'll make it go faster by taking out what they see as unnecessary health and safety checks and stuff like that. But then they'll take them out, and then when the wind's blowing the wrong direction, metaphorically, the health and safety checks turned out to be very necessary. And it turns out then that that software might do something catastrophically wrong. So a variety of things can go wrong. And there is no simple answer, which takes account of all four of these uh, danger modes, which is why Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, and a whole host of people from within the AI community too, are increasingly raising the alarm. They're saying, you used to think AI might take decades before it reached this danger state. Well, there are scenarios in which it might get there a lot faster. Therefore, let's hurry up and prioritize deeper thinking on the control and alignment of AI. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of my personal concerns, I, I guess, in this area is uh, there has been a rapid increase in the automation of weapon systems, and that would include drones, tanks, and naval vessels. And of course, our nuclear weapons already have some level of automation built into them, and they have for decades. But so I, I'm wondering, in a sense, if we're not setting the stage for this worst case scenario, not only by developing artificial general intelligence, but we're also arming it, right? This is the worst kind of arms race. We often talk about AI improving because it's locked into an arms race of one sort or another. We talk about AI malware in a competition with AI security software, and each tries to outsmart the other. And as a result, it improves on both sides quickly. But the worst kind of AI arms race is to do with armaments. And it's predicted long ago the Stanley Kubrick film featuring Peter Sellers as Dr. Strangelove. This, uh, yeah. spoiler yeah. alert, the world does not end well because of systems which were locked into various processing and humans could no longer intervene to do anything about it. Well, it's tempting to say, well, we'll always have humans intervening. We'll always keep humans in the loop. And that is a very good principle. But sometimes the pace of an attack may be so swift that it won't be practical to ring up higher command and say, dear Mr. General, dear Mr. President, do you agree with responding in this way to this ongoing swarm attack of drones? So there, has, there is inevitably a tendency to give more autonomy to some of these weapon systems. And the fear is if you don't give autonomy to your weapon systems, the other guy will give increasing autonomy to their weapon systems. So we are in a terrible dilemma here. That's why there has to be discussion between the leaders of conflicting powers. And we did this in the past. The Cold War was diffused to an extent by ideologues or former ideologues, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, being able to talk to each other. Even before that, Richard Nixon and Leonard Brezhnev were able to talk to each other despite other things which made these two powers strong adversaries of each other. There were reasons for them to have a shared apprehension about the arms race that they were both participating in. So we need that conversation. We need to accelerate it and we need to have it in a thoughtful, careful, wide ranging way. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let me explore the potential positive benefits of this, right? So you've written about the fourth industrial revolution, which is characterized by rapid change to technology, industries, and society by just increasing interconnectivity and automation. 
our world is getting more complicated. That's happening very rapidly. And as human beings, we're really not doing a good job managing it. So I guess in terms of potential positive benefits, do you think super intelligent AI is necessary or could be at least very beneficial to help managing this increasingly complicated world that we're creating? Absolutely. This greater augmentation of our intelligence can help us to control some of the dangers that are facing us. We have simple things. Well, I call them simple. We have marvelous things such as Wikipedia and uh, Google Search, which are powered in various ways by collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. Wikipedia is maintained uh, often by simple bots, which uh, protect it against defacement and uh, graffiti. So there is already a lot that smart software can do to help us keep control. Increasingly, smart software will flag up mistakes in fact, just the way that when I type today, it underlies my misspelling, it underlines my bad grammar and different color. There's this new thing in Microsoft Word which sort of suggests that I'm being too informal sometimes and and increasingly it's going to say you have quoted a fact do you realize this is disputed this politician who makes this claim do you realize the politician said exactly the opposite thing uh, just 10 minutes ago now this is controversial do we want to outsource our truth telling to an ai well i think we have to do it carefully but it certainly can help so there will be systems from ai which can help us to reach better collective intelligence but we shouldn't uh, abrogate or we shouldn't abdicate all responsibility to the AI. We shouldn't say, well, this AI has given us good advice 10 times in a row in the past. Therefore, we're always going to trust it. We need to keep on querying it as much as we can because it might go wrong in some of the ways I've just explained that there could be brilliance before uh, a mistake. So we need to keep on querying it. But if we do that, then there are possibilities for seeing better solutions to the dilemmas we face, just as AI is already helping with problems in science. Science had problems such as how do proteins fold up these three-dimensional structures made up of long strings of short amino acids. And this has been a problem discussed by scientists for 50 or 60 years with little progress being made. Now, AI has got the intelligence to solve that and say, if you create such and such a protein, the likelihood is going to take this three-dimensional shape and will therefore engage in these biochemical interactions with implications for diseases, with implications for medical cures. Well, in the same way, I think AI is going to structure our arguments differently. It's going to look at the little arguments we make, the sort of amino acids, and it's going to structure rich new compounds, synth uh, I'm speaking allegorically here, but can rich new uh, proteins here out of uh, proposals, which will, it turns out, uh, command the assent of people from different partisan viewpoints. So everybody will be able to say, well, it wasn't quite what I had in mind, but this is a brilliant synthesis. This is the thing that will give us a win-win, despite initially thinking we could never reach agreement. So AI, I think, can do all of that, but we've got to manage it carefully and we've got to design for that as well. It won't happen by accident in my view. Yeah, yeah. Well, and since you've touched on biology and that was something I definitely wanted to get into because again, as a futurist, especially with your specializations, you have been following longevity research and life extension. So let me ask about, there are a couple of examples here. One of them was uh, Liz Parrish underwent retroviral DNA therapy that lengthened her telomeres um, it also increased her muscle strength. Uh, Dr. David Sinclair announced just recently that by selectively applying three of the four Yamanaka factors, his team believes they've been able to reverse aging in cells. So in terms of the biological aspect of this, especially in terms of aging, do you see a, a cure for aging coming soon? Well, I think there's about a 50% chance that we will have effective, widely available, low-cost treatments by 2040. In mm. part, that's based on my belief that AI is going to get a lot smarter in the meantime yeah. and will help us. But there is already evidence of the plasticity of aging. You have pointed out signs that at least some aspects of aging can be reversed due to this uh, stem cell reprogramming, due to 
uh, use of the enzyme telomerase to lengthen telomeres in some parts of the body due to the epigenetic reprogramming of the Yamanaka factors. I think each of these are part potentially of a comprehensive solution. Although aging is plastic, it is complicated. There are many dimensions to aging. It is likely that some treatments can solve some of the damage which gives rise to aging, but there will be other types of damage as well. Some people speculate about seven types of fundamental damage at the cellular, extracellular levels. This is at the biochemical and molecular levels. And there are a number of suggestions in each case for how the damage can be undone, like induce, introducing extra stem cells, like the epigenetic reprogramming. But I think a combination of these will turn out to work. I think we'll see it first in mice, because mice, although they're much smaller than us, have some similarities to us. And I think in the next couple of years, it's likely we will see what's called robust mouse rejuvenation, which is you take an ordinary middle-aged mouse, which means it's about a year and a half old if it's kept in a laboratory conditions. So it hasn't had any special treatment. Then you give it a combination of treatments and then its remaining life expectancy, which you can measure by watching it for another few years, will double compared to what it was before. And when mm. people see this happening, they're suddenly gonna think, goodness, aging really is plastic. And next it's probably gonna happen in dogs because dogs live longer than mice, but shorter than humans, maybe 10, 15 years. And people love their pet dogs, and they hate it when their pet dogs in dog middle age start slowing down. So when these treatments are applied in dogs and their dogs have a new lease of life, chasing things like they used to do several years previously, again, it's gonna accelerate a large public demand for figuring out how to apply the same treatments, not just in mice and in dogs, but in humans. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and so longevity research falls, to me at least, it falls kind of under this umbrella of transhumanism. And I, I would say in the last few decades, artificial joints, implants, and other technologies that transhumanist authors and writers have, have written about quite regularly um, are being implanted in humans all the time to repair or augment the body. So could you argue, do you think that transhumanism is already here and that not only in terms of longevity, but also in terms of, you know, uh, I, I guess, uh, cyborg, you know, uh, capabilities along those lines, maybe the difference is just a matter of degree, I guess, and we'll continue to see that progress. So we have many millions of people whose hips have been replaced and remarkably, they've got a new lease of life. My mother is one of them from being relatively immobile and in a lot of pain. She can sprint around the golf course, not literally sprint, but move much more freely than before. There are people whose limbs were amputated due to horrific accidents of one sort or another, and they now have replacement limbs that are in some ways to be envied. Not yet. People will want to cut off their own limbs, but they have new features. They are remarkably smart, these new replacement limbs. I had my eyes lasered a number of years ago, maybe 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, and that was a great enhancement, so I don't need to bother with contact lenses. But as you point out, the pace of adoption of these enhancements and augmentation is increasing. It used to be there were a few new things every decade, but now there is a whole host of new things available. And that leads to the possibility of super longevity in which we can overcome the drawbacks of aging and deterioration, super intelligence, which overcomes some of the cognitive shortcuts that our brain often takes. We have various biases, we have various flaws in our reasoning, which maybe weren't so bad in simpler times when we were living on the African savannah, but when larger problems face us that require longer joined up thinking, these biases hurt us. So we could become super intelligent. Transhumanism also talks about super happiness, overcoming our tendencies to depression, to egotism, mm, to okay. And so on. And I also talk about super democracy, which is improvements in how we interact with each other rather than 
having power abuse all the time rather than seeking to deceive the other guy's group because we have an instinctual dislike of them. This is what's happened throughout all of history, abuse of power in the family, in the tribe, in the nation, in the world, but we can undo that as well. So this transhumanism is uh, coming faster and has larger potential and more importantly, it's now an explicit philosophy rather than just being an idea occasionally people thought about. It's going to be introduced as a guiding principle to set the target for society rather than us worshipping at the GDP, which is let's have the more economic goods, which isn't bad in its own self. There's nothing inherently wrong with economic exchange, but we need a better measurement. And that's going to be the transhumanist vision of the five S's. Uh, which I touched on. Ah, okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for providing kind of an overview of transhumanism. Now, in terms of repairing the body and extending longevity, there do appear to be limits, you know, and if not for younger people, definitely for older people, where I think wear and deterioration is already affecting us. Um, so we can repair the body, but when we hit those limits, is is it possible that we may be able to cheat death at some point by uploading our consciousness and perhaps embracing some some form of substrate independent intelligence as Randall Cohn has described? I'm not convinced there are limits to biological repair. There have been various academic papers that have suggested, well, there's a hard limit of an age of 115 or 120. Yeah. I think these papers are poor because they don't consider all the possible repair mechanisms. They basically say, well, given certain sort of repair mechanisms, these other problems will remain. But I think if we are comprehensive enough in our repair mechanisms, I envision even quite elderly people may in stages be made youthful again. It won't happen overnight. It'll be a slow process, but it can be done. So I'm not bought into this view that there are limits to our biology. I do also have some questions about this uploading of minds. I think it may be possible. It's going to be very hard. It's going to be much harder than the biological rejuvenation we've spoken about. I can see in due course there may be uploads of my mind that mimic many parts of my character, and they may even claim to be me. And in some senses of identity, they will be me and my identity will have bifurcated. There will be the original me and there'll be a new me. But I'm not sure I would want in that case, the original me to be shut down because I'm not sure that the me me part will actually be over there. So I'm unsure about this and it's tied up with being unsure about qualia and so on. And I know some people are quite confident that they will quite happily shut their biological self down when they see a silicon version already running. I'm not sure I could do that, so I might be persuaded to change my mind in due course when I understand the philosophy of mind better. Yeah, yeah. Well, and the reason I'd mentioned that was a few moments ago, I mentioned super intelligent AI maybe being necessary to manage this increasing complexity in our world. Now, Ray Kurzweil actually had another view on this that I thought was really interesting. He'd said the pace of change will be so astonishingly quick that we won't be able to keep up unless we enhance our own intelligence by merging ourselves with the intelligent machines they're creating. So do you think that we're ultimately looking at some kind of a merger between humanity and machines? I think that's correct. I think we are going to have more mechanical or let's say techno we're going to have more technology inside our bodies. That's the extension of the trend we're on. But I don't think that's going to help us to keep up with the machines. I think that if the augmentation is done via chips in the brain, the neural link method that Elon Musk has been advocating, I think that will allow us to do things we can't do today, but it won't allow us to think as fast and as powerfully as a pure silicon computer because of the constraints of the skull and the limitations of our biology. So whilst we are still primarily biological with uh, technological add-ons, I don't think we can compete and keep up with uh, computers or the machines. So that solution won't work. That's why Ray himself points to uploading. And I've given my reasons why I don't think that's gonna happen 
before artificial general intelligence emerges. So we might eventually upload, and it may or may not be a desirable thing to do. I'm still holding my counsel about that, but I don't think it's gonna happen fast enough for us to keep control of this singularity. Therefore, we need to approach the control of the singularity in different ways, which is programming in sufficient appreciation of values and ethical choices uh, early enough in the design of AI. Yeah, yeah. Well, David, let me close. Let me thank you for your time, number one. But let me close with this question. I want to shed a different light on Stephen Hawking's thought. He, he again, said that AI could spell the end of the human race. But instead of looking at that in a negative context, which, which I think is how he intended it, what if that's because humanity is transformed into something even better? Do you think that could be where this is all going? So to defend Stephen Hawking here, and I feel some kinship from him, we, we were both at the same college in, in Cambridge, Gonville and Keys. Uh, he was quite a few years ahead of me, but we were both fascinated by theoretical physics. I was never quite in his class, but uh, I have uh, some loyalty to him for all kinds of reasons. He did say that it could be the worst outcome, but it could also be the best outcome. So he ah. was uh, appreciative of the possible positive uh, developments so I think you're right, and we could see the uplifting of humanity into a stage when we would no longer call ourselves simple humans. We might call ourselves a new species, humanity plus, or post-humans, in the way that we sometimes think of ourselves as still being apes, but we think, well, we're more than apes. We are humans. We are apes plus. In the same way, there is the possibility that with the help of technology, outsiders and insiders, if we have the super intelligence looking after us beneficially, we can indeed evolve pretty fast into what would be like a, a new species with lots more capabilities that we can't yet fully anticipate, no more than the apes. If they'd had a conference in Cambridge or wherever, eight million years ago, contemplating what they might do with bigger brains, they wouldn't have been able to come up with studying Pythagoras' theorem, composing uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony uh, and all the drama of Hamlet and Macbeth and Breaking Bad and all the other wonderful things that we do with our great brains. So we can't anticipate it, but there is the possibility it could be profoundly wonderful, the humanity plus, but there is also the possibility it could be profoundly terrible, that we could end up with a few people somehow dominating the rest of society and it would be a, a new dark age again. So that outcome needs to be evaluated alongside. And the choice, it's up to us as humans. And when I say it's up to us, it's not just for us to tick a box because we're all going to tick the humanity plus box. We've got to get involved. We've got to get involved in changing the systems in which AI is developed and deployed. We've got to get involved in setting sufficient regulatory oversight that certain things will be actually forbidden because they're so dangerous, just like we don't let people experiment with any kind of a nuclear power plant they want. We say, these things could be very dangerous with the radioactivity. Let's ensure that there is safety here. So in the same way, we need some tighter constraint over some AI development. We also need some public acceleration of the things that will be very good when they happen, but haven't taken place quickly enough yet. So that's what each person listening to this uh, podcast should bear in mind. If they like this humanity plus future, this super intelligence, this super abundance or sustainable super abundance, as I call it, they should figure out how they can help accelerate it and help deviate from the risks of falling into the new dark age of humanity minus. Absolutely. David, let me thank you again so much for your time today, sir. It's been a real pleasure.